Hi, welcome to my backyard. So today I am brewing a beer and I thought it would be really fun to show you guys how my brew day goes, especially because I've been sharing a Brewmaster Beer Simulator on my channel. So I thought maybe I would show you what my actual brew day is like. So we're in my backyard. It's like a balmy 34 degrees Fahrenheit today. No big deal. I actually prefer to brew when it's cold out because it's easier to warm up when it's cold than it is to cool down when it's like 90 degrees and you have a burner going. Um, so yeah, I'm actually not that bummed about it being this cool today. But before we get into the brew day, there are two orders of business we gotta go over. Firstly, we gotta figure out what we're listening to. So. I am motivated by music. I always have been. I gotta have music to do the most mundane things, including emptying the dishwasher. So today my playlist is actually the one that is on my channel, which is my favorites from the Fratellis, Jack White, and Queen, which are my favorite bands. So you guys can check out what I'm listening to today by looking at that playlist. The second order of business is we gotta figure out if our brew dog is ready for the day. So. Not everyone has a brew dog, but I'm sure those of you who know how important brew day dogs are, you know that they have to be up for it too because brew days are gonna be a long day. It's like five hours at best, really. Um, it can be a long day and it's a lot of waiting around. So it's nice to have someone to talk to. And if you don't have a brew dog, I recommend getting one, obviously, don't get a dog just to have a brewing companion, but they make the day so much better. And they also uh, guard your wort from, you know, pesky squirrels and neighborhood cats. So let's ask Echo if he is ready for a brew day. Echo, are you ready to brew today? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are we gonna have a good do brew day? You're unenthused. You're unenthused. Bubba, are you ready? Are you ready for a brew day, huh? Are we gonna have a good brew day today? Are we? Are we? Good boy. Good boy. Yes, you're so handsome. I think you're ready. I think you're ready. All right, looks like Echo's ready to go. So let's go over equipment. So we have the most important part, which is our burner, because there's gonna be an hour boil when you're brewing beer. So I have this Jimungus burner. Um, um, fortunately, I've already filled my pot with six gallons of water, so I'm not moving that. But I forget how many, um, whatever the measurement is of heat it produces, but it's a propane burner, and I get about like two brews out of it, uh, out of one propane tank. But we have our burner, we have our 11 and a half gallon stainless steel pot, which will be for heating up water for our mash tun. Uh, when we steep the grains but also it will be doing our hour boil stainless steel is important because the hops we use are highly acidic and if you have an aluminum pot which most like turkey fryers come with um, the acid in the hops can slowly deteriorate and react to the aluminum over time so it's very important to have an 11 gallon stainless steel pot we've got echo already doing his duty uh, we have my mash tun it's not very uh special you know it's just a 10 gallon uh drink holder from home depot we've s switched out the plastic uh spigot with this nice stainless steel one it's a like a ball lock type system and then let's uh see what's under the hood here of course i don't know if you can tell somewhere in here I've been using this um, mash tun for, I don't know, six years, and I steep my grains at like 160 to 100, like usually like 160 degrees, and over time, this is a double wall drink cooler, right, to keep drinks cold. Over time, the heat has actually started to warp. Um, actually, you can see right there, right there, there's a little bubble. The uh, heat has started to warp to warp it but anyway inside here we have a false bottom 
which is literally just like a sheet of hold stainless steel and it's very sharp so that's why i put this little red buffer tubing on the outside but also it helps to kind of uh put an extra space between the walls so grain doesn't fall down and then if grain does fall down we have this cute little uh screen in there with <laughs> grain particles don't come with it but you know six years of using it uh there's bound to be some leftover grain but uh there's the screen to catch some any any other grain particles that fall through and then i actually do now use a grain bag as well that sits right on top of our grain or our false bottom so i have multiple layers of protection against grain falling through and also to make sure that water is getting through my grains now because i've used this a lot i do have holes in my grain bag because i use a stainless steel spoon and it cuts it along there but that's why i have so many measures so then we put our grain in here with our hot water and we put the lid on and we go uh, an hour of steeping here we have some uh, additives adjuncts we got amylase enzyme and gypsum, which are already in my water. The amylase helps break down the starches in the grain uh, for fermentable sugar yield. The gypsum is a proactive uh, clearing agent, but also helps uh, harden the water. And then the Irish moss is also a clearing agent that you put in at the end. It gets sticky and the proteins in the water or in the beer will stick to it and it will drop out as it's fermenting. Here we have our refractometer, which helps uh, show us the sugar in the beer. Uh, I, if I remember, I check it after I've transferred my wort from the mash tun into the brew pot, but usually I just check it at the end. This makes it so I don't have to use a hydrometer and test jar, it's just cleaner. Then we have various, uh, thermometers we have this one which i use to heat up like two gallons of water that i'm going to rinse my grains i've got a floating thermometer which will hang out in my grain we have our spoon stainless steel spoon and it actually has a bottle opener at this end for reasons uh, we have the tubing that will attach to this thing and go to my pot whenever we're transferring the liquid and then I have my wort chiller, which if you watch my Brewmaster Sims stream, we used it and it, cold water goes in, goes through the coils and goes out, cooling the, the wort. And then we have some grain bags so my grains aren't floating in my beer. So that's the equipment and obviously we have the bucket um, and an airlock for whenever the beer or the wort is done boiling. All right, on to the ingredient portion of this video. I will put a picture of my recipe on the screen here so you can see it all listed out. But here is what we're dealing with, our grains and our hops. So for our base malt, we have our rye malt, which is green, and I always appreciate that. It is a huskless grain, which means it can actually get gummy in our mash tun whenever we are, uh, whenever we are mashing our grains. So you want to be mindful of that. I'll probably throw in some rice hulls with this beer, uh, just so that doesn't happen. So we have our rye pale ale. We're going to use five uh, five pounds of that. We have some pale ales now. Uh, we're going to use five pounds of pail. I have in a U.S. pail and a British pail. These are just open, so I'm going to combine them just because it's what I have in my fridge. So these are our main base malts. I also have a pound of Munich that I'm going to throw in just to bump up the uh, sugars a little bit. And then we have for flavor some extra flavor. We have Caramel 20, which is also going to add color to our beer. But more importantly, it's going to add some sweetness, which is going to help uh, round out the spiciness of the rye. And then we have carapils, which helps to also round out the flavor, gives a smoother mouthfeel, and also gives better head retention uh, whenever it's carbonated. 
And then, like I said, the Munich is just, I'm just adding that for some more fermentable sugars. And we're doing a pound of those, five pounds of the pale, five pounds of the rye. And then for our hop lineup, we have our 60 minute boil hop, which is the Columbus. That's gonna give us bitterness. We have a middle of the boil hop cascade and it's gonna give us some bitterness and some flavor. Then we have an end of the boil hop, which is Citra. That's just mainly flavor being added. Uh, these two are very citrus forward hops. Then this beer requires a seven day dry hopping, which is when we add hops to the already fermented beer for seven days. And we're gonna do an ounce of Cascade, an ounce of Amarillo. These hops are very similar, very citrus forward, grapefruit. And when they're in the uh, secondary ferment as a dry hop, they're strictly only giving us flavor, no bitterness since they're not being boiled. So those will be in a secondary ferment for seven days. And then for our yeast, we have the Safe Ale um, USO5 from the Fermentis line. It just finishes very cleanly. It's a, uh, a US ale. Uh, yeast and it finishes cleanly which is really nice for IPAs because in IPAs you want your hops to shine and not really have uh, strong esters or flavor profiles from your yeast. So this is our ingredient lineup. Now for the uh, grains I'm going to measure out the five pounds that I need of the base malts and crush all of my grains together so then we can mash them and get the most sugar out of them. As I mentioned earlier, rye and wheat as well are huskless, huskless grains. Um, as you can see, our malted barley here, the pale ale, you can kind of see that they still have the rough husk on the outside, whereas the wheat is smooth. And what happens whenever you're mashing uh, these huskless grains is they can start to gum up, which makes it very difficult to get liquid through. Um, that being like the initial liquid that they steep in, but also later when you're sparging your grains, you pour more liquid on top. So whenever it's gummy like that, the liquid won't go through. So you're losing volume, potential volume for your beer, um, but also you're not getting a, a good, uh, you're not, you're losing sh potential sugars, right? Because they're getting stuck in the mash. They're getting stuck within the grains because it won't go through. To combat that, what you can do to help irrigate the water a little bit uh, through your huskless grains a little more easily is use rice hulls. Uh, rice hulls are kind of like adding peat to your soil. They make little channels for water to get through, um, making it so the, the huskless grains like rye or wheat don't gum up on you. And so I will probably go ahead and add uh, probably like half a pound of rice hulls to my mash just so that doesn't happen. Now for me, it's not that big of a deal because I do put my grains in uh, a bag and I also have like the false bottom and everything. But for those of you who do not have the false bottom and are just using a mash ton, uh, rice hulls can really be a game changer just to help uh, ensure that the water is getting through your grains and you're not losing any volume or any potential fermentable sugars. All right, our water for steeping the grains is currently heating up on my burner. You can probably hear how loud it is, but we're trying to get to like 170 because we want to steep at like 150 and we're currently at like 130. We're getting there. And then I did just bring out my grain. There's what, 13 pounds of grain. And I am have, I do have rice hulls to throw in there as well. Um, I like to put the water in first 
and then put the grains in. I wanted to go ahead and take uh, time to talk about cleanliness and brewing so even though all of my things today are gonna be boiled for the most part uh, and go through the boiling process which actually will kill off any bacteria I'm still sanitizing everything so like my mash tun uh, I sanitize my mash tun all of the equipment I'm using despite it going into a boil I still sanitized it because sanitization is the most important part of brewing and fermenting in general because if you don't sanitize you can get bacteria which are going to sour things you don't want to be soured and completely ruin it and it's frankly it's a lot of work to go down the drain literally because when you ruin a batch of beer especially six gallons like i'm doing today you have to dump it if it's gross so um sanitization and cleanliness is the most important thing whenever you're fermenting anything and so yeah even though everything is going into a boil I still went ahead and sanitized it just in case just an extra measure because of any surface bacteria especially because I'm using plastic plastic the little uh, the little cuts in plastic the microscopic ones that we don't see uh, can harbor bacteria and things that are nasty and will make your beer nasty so I definitely made sure to sanitize the plastic the bucket that I'm using especially the bucket and the airlock I'm using they're gonna be completely sanitized and ready to go for whenever we pour our beer in because it's at its most vulnerable state before it starts fermenting whenever it's chilled and before the yeast has time to take effect so just a PSA sanitize 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 all right we have our grain in our mash tun and I'm afraid, I'm afraid I might have lost some heat because uh, it's about 150, about where we want it to be actually. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and put the lid on so we don't lose any more heat. Um, but I'm afraid I may have lost some heat because I had to, uh, <laughs> I was messing around with trying to pour the water into the mash tun because it's a lot, but anyway, so we're gonna let that steep for an hour, and the next time you see me, we will be transferring that liquid through this into there. All right, now we are heating two gallons of water, which is for our uh, sparging, which is actually rinsing the grains. So we're almost to our hour of steeping, and we will transfer our grain water into the this pot and then we will rinse the grain to get any more sugars out of it and proteins um, we will rinse it to get any remaining fermentable sugars out of it but yeah it seems like we held temperature pretty well This is my favorite part because it smells so good. It's just like sweet grain water, literally smells like biscuits or something. And yeah, it says we are at like 160, so actually over temperature, but that's perfect because the uh, warmer it, the warmer it steeps, the less fermentable sugar and the more malty the beer and the cooler it steeps, so like 149 to 150, uh, the more fermentable sugar and the thinner the beer is gonna be. So it's actually, we're perfect. Look at that color, beautiful. We're just draining it. And yeah, that's the color we're gonna have. So our liquid, as you can see, a lot of it has gone out. So I'm gonna start trying to get more out of it and like picking the bag up and picking up the mash tun to try and get some of the initial liquid out. But just a little side note, um, 
after I'm done with the grains, if you have chickens, you could feed them to the chickens so all the nutrients are gone. I don't have chickens, so actually what I do is I compost my grains. I have compost bins, so I throw it on the compost, and uh, my parents can use it for their garden next year or whenever the compost is ready. Okay, so most of the liquid is out of the mash tun, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my two gallons of water that's heated to about the same temperature that the grain is, and I'm going to pour it in, usually about quarters, pour it on, let each batch of water go through, and as it goes through, we'll see that the uh, each time it gets clearer and clearer. So that means we're doing a good job at rinsing it and getting all of the fermentable sugars out. All right, now that I've gotten most of the liquid out um, and into my main boiling pot, I'm going to continue to keep grains in there to drain into my other pot, and then that way gravity can take its course and we can get some more liquid, and then I'll start getting this to boil, and then I can add the liquid later on because it's precious gold. I don't want to waste any of it or lose any of it. So later on, whenever we get this boiling and we get some more liquid off of the grains as they drip out, uh, we'll add it into the boil because once again, the boil kills and sanitizes everything. So we'll add it on later. And usually it does affect the boil a little bit just because it cools it down because it's colder liquid. So we'll have a little bit of disturbance in our boil, but other than that, it should be fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this vat of wort onto my burner and get it the heat on it so we can start boiling. All right, now, as our wort here starts to uh, get close to boiling, we gotta keep an eye on it. Obviously it's not close yet, but we gotta keep an eye on it because all of the sugars in there are going to try and cause a boil over whenever they get hot. So we're gonna watch it and make sure that that doesn't happen because it's a sticky mess. That's the uh, main reason I brew outside other than brewing kind of smells funny, but uh, <laughs> whenever you add the hops. But yeah, whenever it starts to get close to boiling, we wanna watch it because all of the sugars that are in there are gonna try and and uh, they're gonna rush up and try to boil over and so we wanna like stop that before it happens. And then once the boil does begin, we'll add our 60 minute hops. Speaking of brew dogs, like that one, um, some people actually do take their spent grains and they make them into dog biscuits. Now, I, we don't like to uh, serve Echo too much grain because he's got bad skin issues and it's not good for him. Um, so I'm sure he would love it if we did like a, a, like a peanut butter grain biscuit. I'm sure he would love it. But um, yeah, some people they find recipes online for dog biscuits out of uh, spent grains. So you could also do that if you don't, if you want to reuse it in that purpose. But like I said, we compost it. So it does get reused eventually in the garden. All right, we're getting close to boil. Whenever we get this nice foamy head on the top, means our boil is getting close. So we're gonna have to watch it. Um, I probably will stop recording and watch it so that doesn't happen. I don't wanna boil over, so. Um, but this, yes, this means we're getting close to a boil, uh, to start boiling whenever we see this nice creamy head starting to form and then eventually we'll start to see little bubbles going on uh, starting to surface. So I'll show you, oh, like right there, right there on the side, there's a little bit of uh, action going on, it's starting to break a little bit, but yeah, whenever that happens, I'm going to have to throw down the phone and uh, <laughs> watch it and make sure we don't get a boil over but yeah we're gonna start seeing some bubbles 
Oh, the tension's too much. We can see on the edge there, right there. We're starting to boil. There we go. All right, now I gotta watch it. So this is why you wanna have a bigger pot than the volume because you want this vigorous rolling boil. And that's also why I usually uh, use about two gallons of water to uh, steep my grains because this boil is gonna evaporate a lot of my liquid, right? So I want to have to start out with more than my final volume. So whenever I lose uh, volume and evaporation, I end up with the amount I'm supposed to end up with, in this case, six gallons. So we're currently boiling eight gallons. So if I had this in a 10 gallon pot, it'd probably be like right there. And we would have already had a boil over. So uh, it's very important to have a pot that's bigger than what you're boiling. Most starter kits are five gallons. And for those, if you have a five gallon pot, I would probably do like a two and a half gallon boil and then use liquid, uh, use some water to top up at the end. But whenever you uh, use water at the end to top it up, you risk thinning out your beer and losing some of your hop retention. So um, that's why I'd rather do a full boil, full batch boil. But look how beautiful that is, guys. It might get a little bit darker in the boil, we'll see. But this boil is now converting sugars and condensing the sugars into fermentable sugars. Um, I didn't get a reading before I started, unfortunately. But anyway, next we're gonna get our boil hops ready and then we'll start our timer for an hour because this will be an hour vigorous boil. But I'm just making sure that these, this foam isn't gonna start to creep up there for me. I think, I think we're okay. So yeah, I'll get a, um, I'm glad today's actually a pretty still day. Yesterday was pretty windy and snowing. So I'm glad we don't have wind uh, blowing my flame all around cause that's never fun. And I'm mostly nervous about Echo in that situation because he doesn't understand the concept of heat and I'm afraid we're gonna lose an ear one of these days. He's gonna singe it off. But anyway, let me go get my hops ready. All right, here we have our boil hop, which means it's mostly gonna give us bitterness. It's a, the Columbus. And as you can see, they're just like these little pellets. They kind of look like rabbit food and I put them in a sock. Uh, because whenever they're in the boil, they kind of turn to green mush and I'd rather be able to pull them out and have the most clean uh, transfer as I can. Um, but yeah, these, uh, these bad boys are gonna be for bitterness and um, we'll be in our boil for the whole 60 minutes. Um, and then we will be careful with them because hops are poisonous to dogs. Now, I don't think they dogs would um, go after hops normally, but whenever they have the sweet malt water on them, of course, they're going to be drawn to it kind of like antifreeze. So we keep these out of reach of Mr. Echo because I do not want to spend the day watching him vomit up hops. So anyway, we're going to throw these in and then start our 60 minute uh, boil time. All right, there is our first hop. Now, yep, that's gonna maybe cause some boil over problems because, oh, maybe not. So when you add the hops, the oils actually kind of help break up that surface tension. So it can help actually put, put down like any boil over. But yeah, now we're gonna let those boil. It's now 250, so we're gonna let it boil for till 350. All right, it's 45 minutes into our boil and Echo is ready to go on to our next step, which is adding our 15 minute hops. These will add flavor and maybe a touch of bitterness. So these are the Cascade. We're gonna plop them into our boil. And then at this time, we're also going to put in some Irish moss for clearing 
for some proactive clearing and we're gonna put in our word chiller so it can get sanitized in the boil and I'll probably throw in my floating thermometer and my spoon later on in the boil just so they get clean uh, anything gets killed off of them as well because we need the spoon and the floating thermometer and the wort chiller whenever it's chilling and we don't want any bacteria being uh, added or contaminating the wort at that time so in what 10 more minutes we'll add um, our last hop which is the citra for five minutes which is just purely for flavor but right now I'm gonna add the wort chiller and some Irish moss all right I just put in the Irish moss now we're gonna put the wort chiller in now because this has extra water in the coils from the last time because I don't usually drain it as it heats up the water inside it's gonna start spitting so we want to make sure our brew dog doesn't get hit in the face with hot water. Um, but as you can see, my boil stopped because my wort chiller is really cold. So it kind of like shocked the boil a little bit, but it'll start boiling again. And there's one of our hop additions just hanging out. And as you can see here on the side of my pot, we had some uh, foaming up, almost a boil over while I was uh, away. I was cleaning up my, um, mash tun and stuff and we almost had a boil over but we didn't but yeah that's the hop gunk that I don't want in my beer um it so it mostly gets contained in the hop sock but of course sometimes some gets out but I just saw as you can see water's already starting to come out of my wort chiller so it will start spewing water so we want to stay clear of that because it will be hot but anyway we still have uh, 15 minutes to go in the boil in 10 minutes I'll add the citra hops and then we'll be ready to start uh, chilling this beer which on this cool 35 degree day I don't think we're really gonna have problem uh, chilling the beer so see you in a bit citra hop time bloop it's a, it's a, that's threatening a boil over by the way in case you want to know <laughs> I don't know if you can notice but we definitely lost a considerable amount of liquid in this boil. It's been boiling this hard the whole time, which is what we want. But I don't even know where it started. Maybe like here? So we definitely, uh, like there? Uh, we definitely lost a considerable amount of liquid, but hopefully we're still at like the six gallon mark. All right, it's the end of the boil. And it's now time to pluck out our hot bags, which unfortunately I can't, I guess I could do it with one hand, but uh, I probably won't show that because it takes 500 years to find them all. But then I'll move this onto uh, the ground and we can, I can start uh, chilling it with the wort chiller. All right, we have the wort chiller hooked up. We have a little bit of a leak, but it's not going in my beer, so it's fine. So now what we want to do is we want to stir it for like two minutes straight to have what's called a cold break. Um, if you don't stir it, all of your, uh, all of your proteins and gunk in there is going to get shocked and like kind of be gross. So you want to get some motion going and get all the, the cold water that's going through the coils you want to get that cold to go throughout your beer like I said it's a colder day today so this probably won't take too long uh, to cool down my beer so I'm just gonna do this and uh, hopefully it doesn't take long to chill so actually the last time Echo and I brewed we only did a gallon and it was February when there was snow uh, on the ground. So actually I just threw my whole pot in a snow drift and I only used that little five gallon pot to do the one gallon. Let's see what we're at. We're already down to like 120-ish, which is awesome. Uh, we wanna get down to about 80. I think instructions usually say 75, but I say 80 because I'm going to be 
pouring this into my bucket. So we're gonna lose some temperature when I pour it as well. So 80 is good. Anything above 95 is gonna kill your yeast. So I'm just gonna keep stirring and letting this chill. And then we'll pour it in the bucket and pitch the yeast and let her go. All right, so it appear, appears we, about, we got about five gallons of liquid of beer of wort and I'm gonna test it with my refractometer to see where we are gravity wise and if we are a, a few points above where we need to be I may go ahead and top it up with some water but if we're like spot on where we need to be then I'll probably just leave it and let this be a five gallon batch so let me check it with my hydrometer hydrometer with my refractometer real quick okay so how this works is i take a sample of the wort and this only works with pre uh fermented things so before fermentation take a sample of the wort put it on this blue thing slap this thing down and then we look through the viewfinder and you can see there are little uh, numbers there so whatever the sugar is you can see uh, what the starting gravity is which is on the right side that's the, the specific gravity scale is what we're using so once I put uh, as you can see right now it is all blue so once I put some wort on there we'll have a white line and it'll tell us where our starting gravity is. As you can see, our starting gravity is 1.063-ish, which actually isn't bad. So I'm probably actually gonna just leave it at the volume it is and go ahead and toss the yeast because I'm not upset with that at all. And I always like quality over quantity. So um, because it's only a few points off of what it should be or higher than what it should be, I'm actually just gonna leave it and go ahead and pitch the yeast. Here's our little sachet of yeast, and we're just gonna pour it on the top here. And because ales are a top fermenting yeast, they'll just go to town and do their job right there on the top. So we'll put the lid on in the airlock and put it somewhere that's 68 degrees, probably in my office, and we will let it start bubbling away. So hopefully uh, by tomorrow, we'll see bubbles. I will post a community post whenever there are bubbles it, so everyone can see. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I just was kind of really excited to show what my brew day is like, especially since I've been playing beer simulator on my channel. So I hope you enjoyed seeing what my actual brew day is like. Unfortunately, I can't fast forward time like I can in Brewmaster Simulator, but it's still a good time, especially whenever my boy Echo is uh, willing to hang out with me all day. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Please uh, like the video, consider subscribing. I probably... I don't know if I'll do another vlog type video like this, but I was excited to just go ahead and show my brew day since uh, it's something different and not something that everyone else is showing. But thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.